the Unabomber. The Unabomber. Ted Kaczynski, the convicted terrorist known as the Unabomber, has died in prison. He was found unresponsive in his cell while serving four consecutive life sentences for numerous mail and university bombings, which went on from 1978 to 1995. The convicted terrorist was considered America's most prolific bomber. Ted Kaczynski, also known as the Unabomber, killed himself earlier this year. But as one newspaper puts it, his dangerous ideas still live on. The former maths professor with an IQ of 167 carried out more than a dozen bombings in the 70s, 80s, and 90s as part of his war against modern technology and the destruction of the environment. Well, he spent decades in hiding and then decades in a prison cell. And yet today, many young people think he's a folk hero. 11 weeks after he was arrested at the Montana shack he called home, Ted Kaczynski stands formally accused tonight of being the so-called Unabomber. The man's a mathematician. He's obviously brilliant. He's white, he's devious, he's well-educated, and he gets sick satisfaction from killing and maiming people. For decades, the Unabomber's reign of terror fascinated and horrified people in equal measure. 17 years, 16 bombs, three dead, and 23 wounded. It was one of the most expensive and longest running manhunts in history. Ted Kaczynski evaded capture from the 70s until the mid 90s, despite a million dollar reward for information leading to his arrest. There are many theories as to what led Kaczynski to become the Unabomber. Born in Chicago in 1942, he displayed a remarkable intelligence from an early age. After scoring 167 on an IQ test, he skipped the sixth grade. A full scholarship to Harvard followed at just 16. In his second year there, Kaczynski signed up for a study by the psychologist Henry Murray. He had worked in the Office of Strategic Services during the Second World War, which would later become the CIA. Some have speculated that the psychological study that Kaczynski applied for was a part of the MK Ultra program that studied the military applications of hallucinogenic drugs. Whatever the truth, the study certainly took its toll on participants. Ted basically became a guinea pig in an ethically dubious psychological experiment. Kaczynski moved to Michigan for his postgraduate degrees, combining a teaching role with his studies. But he became increasingly disillusioned with the job as an assistant professor. Instead, Kaczynski threw himself into survival training, spending more and more time in the wilderness. In 1971, he moved off-grid full-time, to a cabin he built in rural Montana. He wrote that this was one of his favorite areas until it became overcrowded. He said he found too many people around his cabin and a nearby plateau had a road put right through the middle of it. It was then that he decided he would, in his words, work on getting back at the system, revenge. His first bomb targeting Buckley Christ, a professor of materials engineering at Northwestern University, would injure the police officer who opened it. Over the next 17 years, 15 bombs would follow, becoming increasingly sophisticated. Due to his off-grid lifestyle and fondness for leaving misleading clues, police officers had no significant leads beyond the locations he targeted and this composite sketch made in 1987. But then in 1995, the Unabomber reached out. He offered to stop his campaign if a credible news outlet would publish his manifesto in full. And they did, under instructions from the FBI who believed somebody may recognize the writing style. It was all there today, all 35,000 words of the Unabomber's message to America. Within weeks of the Washington Post publishing the text, the Unabomber's family began to suspect him. There was a particular phrase where he had called modern philosophers cool-headed logicians, mm -hmm. and I had recalled a similar phrase in a letter he had once sent me. In 1996, his brother led investigators to the wooden cabin in Montana. Inside, police found their prime suspect, a draft of his manifesto and a live bomb. He wouldn't plead guilty, though, until 1998. Sentenced to four life sentences plus 30 years without parole, he spent the rest of his days behind bars. The Unabomber's Manifesto, which we mentioned in that report, is one of the best-selling books in Amazon's radical political thought category, outselling titles such as the Anarchist Cookbook and Karl Marx's Das Kapital. Here's a few key extracts from Industrial Society and Its Future. The Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. 
They have destabilized society, have made life unfulfilling, have subjected human beings to indignities, have led to widespread psychological suffering and have inflicted severe damage on the natural world. It is not possible to make a lasting compromise between technology and freedom because technology is by far the more powerful social force and continually encroaches on freedom through repeated compromises. He is fairly equal ire for the left and the right, saying that one of the most widespread manifestations of the craziness of our world is leftism. He believed leftism is in the long run inconsistent with world nature, with human freedom, and with the elimination of modern technology. While on the other hand, the conservatives are fools. They whine about the decay of traditional values, yet they enthusiastically support technological progress and economic growth. His conclusion is that the single overriding goal must be the elimination of modern technology and that no other goal can be allowed to compete with this one. Well, the manifesto is 35,000 words long and pretty hard to decipher in some places, but there's no denying that his ideas do resonate with some people, including those who abhor his terror campaign. Even the host of the world's biggest podcast thinks he was right in some ways. They're sneaking up on us. Yeah. Electronics right. and cars, which is also, you know, it's, an, it's also a creation, a mechanical creation. And now more than ever, they're driving computers. Yeah, man. It's true. What I'm trying to say is Ted Kaczynski was right. Oh, my God. We all know that. He Did was you, right. Do you ever read his manifesto? No. I'm scared it's catchy. Yeah, man. It's so <laughs> well, social media is littered with videos from teenagers who are fascinated with the man they call Uncle Ted. Here's the YouTuber called Local Extremist explaining why Gen Z is ready to be Ted-pilled. It is when one wakes up to the fact that technology seemingly rules our daily lives in every facet. Every part from when we get up in the morning to the ring of an alarm clock to when we lay in bed at night doom scrolling through TikTok. It's all increasingly dominated by this invasive technology. There's not one single person left in civilized society that does not have some form or other of a smartphone. You cannot hold down a job, go to school, or even survive without one. It is practically impossible. Some restaurants, gyms, and schools even require you to have a smartphone just to go to class. Many college professors require a smartphone to take quizzes or to log in for your daily attendance points. At each and every level of our society, there is an incredibly invasive amount of technology being dumped on top of us. He was the best guy around. What about the people he murdered? What it's murder? So the Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. OK, let's bring in our guests now. And Max Knoll is a former FBI agent who helped track down Ted Kaczynski to his cabin in the woods of Montana and actually took him into custody. Jamie Gehring and her family were Ted Kaczynski's neighbors in those woods for many years. She met him several times when she was a child and wrote a book about her experiences called Madman in the Woods. Finally, we have Dr. Park Dietz, who is a forensic psychiatrist who played an important role in Kaczynski's prosecution too. Welcome to all three of you. Um, Jamie, if I may start with you, from birth until 16, you were his neighbor and sometimes he would come to your house, sometimes you would bump into him in the woods. What was that like? Yes, my grandfather sold Ted and David their property in 1971. And from that point forward until his arrest in 1996, he was um, a very close neighbor. And when I was very small, he would come to our home for dinner. He would play cards with my parents. And definitely as the years went on, that relationship changed. He seemed to change. And the early years with him, I just remember him being uh, a very strange neighbor, a hermit. He was seemingly just living off the land. And as the years ticked on, I was definitely more fearful of him. And there were interactions that still to this day, when I recount, are very terrifying. There was one very specific moment in when I was a teenager in which I ran into him in the woods and I was alone and he was alone. And it was definitely a defining moment in which I knew something had truly changed in him and how I felt about him. Um, and obviously now, as I've done my research and 
really found out what was going on on a national scale, but also in our backyard, it makes a lot of sense as to why I had those feelings of just terror. Are you a bit surprised to find that Ted Kaczynski is now, among some young people and libertarian types on social media, a bit of a folk hero? I'm very aware of that um, part of our culture that looks at him as sort of a prophet. And I would just advise that people do their research. It is a main focus of my own book and my own studies to really understand where Ted was coming from, his ideals. And really what I found is, as he even says himself, that it was not what he did, his actions, which, by the way, I have to remind, were killing and maiming people, were not done for an altruistic mission. There was also a massive amount of pure hatred and revenge that fueled this serial killer. Max Knoll, uh, you were part of the Unibom task force and part of the longest and most expensive manhunt in US history. What made him so elusive? Well, Ted Kaczynski made it so elusive. <laughs> Ted Kaczynski had an IQ of almost uh, uh, 170, I believe, 160 something. Yeah, 167. Uh, he was a very yeah. intelligent man. He uh, went to Harvard when he was 16. He uh, had his uh, doctorate uh, in mathematics, I believe, by the time he was 20 uh, or 21. He was very, very elusive, and Jamie hit the nail right on the head. He was revenge and anger motivated. All these other things were subterfuge for what he was doing and rationalization, but all the, the documents of which there were almost 40,000 pages of writing that we took from his cabin indicate that he was doing these things because of his anger uh, towards society. He was selecting people and attempting to kill them because they were representational of things that he disliked. He disliked uh, uh, computer scientists. He disliked college professors. He disliked graduate students. He disliked big businessmen. He disliked government officials. He disliked uh, uh, police and authorities. And those were the main groups that he was uh, attempting uh, to kill representatives of. I always called him uh, the equal opportunity uh, killer. He liked killing and seeking revenge on people that um, he didn't care for. He was particular, the airline industry, he, he disliked them because they destroyed the tranquility of the wilderness with their planes flying overhead and so forth. He, he could care less about who was on the plane, whether it was uh, families or children and what have you. He was uh, seeking revenge uh, against the airline industry when he attacked the airplane. Max, so, so uh, Max, how does it make you he, feel? How does it make you feel then when you hear people like Elon Musk or Joe Rogan or perhaps teenagers on YouTube saying maybe he was right? Well, the, he may have been right about some of those ideas, but that wasn't his total being. His total thing was to seek revenge through because of his anger against society, not because of uh, technology, but because they represented things that he didn't like. He didn't, for instance, like uh, uh, psychologists or psychiatrists because mm. they were manipulating the minds, in his words, of uh, people and young people. Um, th they showed their ignorance when they say that he was a uh, icon for uh, those ideas. He wasn't. He was a terrible, evil man who was killing people because ah. they were different than him. Okay. And if they took the time to do the research as Jamie has and read his writings, his autobiography and his 40,000 pages of his journals, they'll come to that conclusion. All of the rest Let of me... that is kind of a subterfuge in my mind uh, to rationalize his own behavior. Let me put that to Dr. Park Dietz. Actually, it was your job, wasn't it? You were retained by the prosecution to determine whether he was a madman, in inverted commas, or, or perhaps evil and responsible for his actions. Um, how far did you get with that? Well, I got through a mountain of documents, interviews by the FBI, a few interviews that uh, my colleagues and I conducted. Um, 
most importantly, a giant uh, quantity of writings by Ted Kaczynski himself. I regarded those as the best evidence we had available. We visited his cabin, looked at the physical evidence. I got to handle his typewriter and his uh, firearms and so on. But the key to all of this, as far as I'm concerned, is to be found in his writings. And I would make a distinction between the writings that were to family and his personal musings versus the manifesto. The personal music musings and his personal writings uh, show that uh, Max Knoll is exactly correct about anger and revenge being central to why he committed these crimes. But the interesting thing is that the manifesto does not show all of that. The manifesto is intellectual content that uh, struck me as not madness, but rather quite rational, if extremist. So I was unwilling to say that the content of his manifesto showed him to be mentally ill. On other grounds, I have reason to believe he was mentally ill, uh, particularly that he was seriously depressed for many years, uh, overlapping with the time that he stopped bombing. And he obviously was very strange, socially isolated, um, suspicious, but I think the key issue about his personality that underlies all of it is that he had immense concern for personal autonomy. Anyone who could interfere with another person's autonomy was to him a threat. Now that's true of many people who are paranoid. In his case, um, nothing was more important than maintaining his own autonomy and not letting anyone control him. The main legal issue was, did he know what he was doing and know it was wrong? And there, the best evidence, I believe, is that the warnings he wrote about the coming bombs and the uh, letters he attached to bombs to entice people to open them show that he knew exactly what he was doing and knew that it was wrong and would harm people. And that's what the law means when it says sane, responsible for the crime. Whether he was schizophrenic or not, I don't know because I never did get to examine him, mm. but I didn't find it in his writings. Do you think, as Max suggested, that he hated psychiatrists and you never got to meet him uh, because he wanted to avoid meeting you? Yes, uh, I was on my way to the Sacramento County Jail with an agent uh, to interview him after years of fighting to get that interview in the courts. The court ordered that I could examine him. Uh, and while we were in the car approaching the prison, we got a phone call saying he decided to plead guilty rather than subject himself to meeting me. <laughs> years later, one of his defense lawyers would tell me that he was afraid that since I worked for the government, I would find him insane to discredit his political philosophy. Jamie, just to go back to your experiences of him, um, is it true that at some point, you know, you felt, looking back, that he actually was going to target your family? Um, not only did I feel that, but in my research, I found that there was a time in which my stepmother experienced some strange feelings out in the woods when she had my toddler sister with her. And um, later she confided in me that she discovered that actually Ted, in what she had read in his writings um, after the arrest, that Ted had a rifle pointed at her and my sister and was contemplating killing them. Um, in addition, there was a lot of sabotage that happened in our shared backyard, <coughs> excuse me, including some wire that was hung, um, basically neck height, that could decapitate a motorcycle rider or an automobile rider of some sort. And I could have been victim to that as well as many in my family. Mm -hmm. He also 
lethally poisoned our family pet, our dog. So we were definitely victims of, of his own sabotage at home. Jamie, um, <clears throat> thank you for telling us about that. I want to just turn to Max for a second. Obviously, it was his brother who spotted the, his, you know, his, you know, Ted's style in his manifesto, which was published in some major national newspapers. Was that the big break for you as investigators? And how did you take it on from there? Well, it was absolutely a big break, but it was more his uh, brother's wife that had uh, focused in on uh, his writings when it was put, when we had the writings published in the uh, Washington Post. And uh, his brother's wife had for a long time suspected uh, Ted. She was paying attention to what we were putting out in the media about who the Unabomber might be. Uh, her husband refused to believe it. We later found a uh, letter uh, that his brother had, that Ted had written to his brother, telling his brother that uh, he knew that his brother thought he had violent ideas, but because of their good Christian upbringing by their parents, he could never bring himself to commit an act of violence. Then he wrote in his journal, ha ha, David will never suspect me now. Well, David didn't, but David's wife did. And finally, David, uh, after birth, the manifesto was published in September. They tried to discount him from September until January when they no longer could. And they finally went to an attorney who came to the FBI uh, and told the FBI that his client believed his brother to be the Unabomber. That started us <clears throat> uh, in, on the investigation uh, of Ted Kaczynski. Max, just briefly, tell us about that day in 1996 when you approached his cabin um, and to arrest him. What kind of a man did you find there? Uh, he was very compliant uh, once he determined who we were. Uh, his physical appearance was shocking to me for a man who had been as successful as he had been for almost 17 years of avoiding detection and so forth. Uh, his clothing was... Uh, actually rotting off of him. He had a pair of blue jeans on that had holes in them and they were falling apart. Uh, his hair was oily and greasy and, and wild. He had, a, he had an oily texture to his skin from being shut up in that cabin for a long period of time. And uh, his uh, body odor was unbelievable. Um, I, I remember the first time I saw him <clears throat> when I went up there, my impression was, my God, is that what we've been looking for for all these years? But Dr. Park Dietz, uh, one of the tragedies of this story is that he was extremely intelligent and could have had a, a great career in academia. People will ask, how does a man who starts off so promisingly end up being the Unabomber? There's a cluster of mental conditions uh, with which every treating psychiatrist and psychologist is familiar, that profoundly impairs a person's ability to relate to other humans. And throughout Kaczynski's writings, it's clear that he longed for a woman, contact with a woman, but he never had the skill to put it together and make that happen. Learning how to stay clean, bathe himself, look good, interact with a human in a supportive way, these were skills he never had. And often those who lack those social skills can become fixed on one idea or another. This is the origin of a great deal of extremist crime, that a person becomes fixed on an idea or ideology, and that becomes central to everything they think everything they do, it becomes a life mission. That's very much what happened with him. And Max, just finally, uh, as someone who knows the man well, do you believe that he killed himself? Uh, I think that's quite possible he could, but he was, he was suffering from terminal cancer. He had been diagnosed, uh, I think, about two years previous to his death and moved from... Uh, Florence, Colorado, from uh, uh, 
the Alcatraz of the Rockies, a maximum security prison in uh, Colorado to uh, Butner, North Carolina, which is a medical facility because he uh, had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. He had attempted suicide uh, once before in custody in uh, Sacramento when he found out that his attorneys were going to uh, use a uh, diminished capacity defense for him. So um, it's possible, uh, or he could have died, uh, you know, from the cancer. Max Knoll, and that was the end of the Unabomber. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, also, Jamie Gehring and Dr. Park Geetz, thank you all very much. And thank you at home and on your phones for watching. If you want to see this episode or any of our previous episodes, do go to our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT1. Until next week, then. Goodbye. <laughs>